Hello and welcome to my channel. As we know, biodiversity refers to the diversity or variability among living organisms in an ecosystem. But this biodiversity is under threat due to various human activities. So the concept of conservation of biodiversity was stressed upon in the Convention on Biodiversity in 1992 so that a sustainable development can come about and there is perpetuation of human beings on earth. In this video, we look at what is actually threatening biodiversity and what are the different conservation strategies that we can employ. Now, the main threat to biodiversity comes from the loss of habitat. The reason being, we humans use up the habitats or use up the forest land for various purposes like the agriculture or for industrialization or for building settlements, for urbanization or in some cases there is fragmentation of the habitat. So there is loss of the habitat in installments and it leads to scattered patches of the forest or scattered patches of the habitat which all together is a huge threat for the biodiversity. Not only that, certain areas, certain ecosystems like marine habitats or even the wetlands are subjected to very high pollution. So there is some kind of human intervention which is upsetting that habitat or due to which the original habitat is getting lost and that is a big problem due to which the biodiversity is also getting depleted. The second reason for the biodiversity to be under threat is poaching. Poaching, the hunting, the harvesting of wild plants and animals, illegal trade in their products like for the horns or tusk or fur or their meat. In some cases, certain plants, exotic plants are, you know, cut down for making up herbal products. So all of these reasons, the illegal hunting down or cutting down of plants and animals is also leading to their loss or is also acting as a threat to biodiversity. The third reason is man-wildlife conflict. Man and wildlife have been, you know, hitting against each other. They have been in conflict due to many, many limitations on the resources. There is limitation on the food, there is limitation on the water resources, there is limitation on the habitat. So due to all of these reasons, the wildlife and man has been in an in a perpetual conflict and that is a big reason for loss of biodiversity. The reason being, when wildlife enters into the human settlements, humans get back and there's a lot of revenge killing that happens or they even trap the animals. So that leads to the animals getting moved out from their original habitat or from their natural habitat. The last reason for uh, th the threat to biodiversity is biological invasion. Now this includes the rapid expansion of a species into a region where it had not previously existed. That is, it has been introduced accidentally into a particular region, but in that region, it has taken over the native flora and is now spreading far and wide. A very good example for this is the wheat parthenium, which was introduced into India from US in the 1950s through wheat plant. So it was a contam contamination through the wheat seeds and that's how we got parthenium in India. But now parthenium is present everywhere. It is acting as a complete weed and growing in all parts of the Indian subcontinent. So these are the four major reasons for threat to biodiversity. The loss of their habitat, illegal and rampant poaching, man-wildlife conflicts that keep occurring and biological invasion by other species. Now due to this, there has been a lot of pressure on biodiversity in many parts of the world. We, the number of endangered species has gone up. A lot of species have, you know, some, some of the species have become extinct or at least extinct from the wild. So to make sure that this doesn't go on further, to make sure that we are able to, you know, conserve our biodiversity, the conservation of biodiversity has been taken up very seriously by governments across the world. Now, there are majorly two categories or two types of conservation strategies. We can have on-site conservation strategy, that is conservation of the ecosystem, conservation of the natural habitat, maintaining and recovering the viable population in their natural surroundings. That is called as in situ conservation strategy. The other type of conservation strategy is ex situ, which happens outside the habitat. So you conserve the components of the biodiversity, but away from their natural surrounding, away from their natural habitat. So let us look at each one of these in detail. In situ strategies includes examples like biosphere reserve. Now these biosphere reserves are large areas which can have other national parks or uh, wildlife sanctuaries inside it. So these are basically undisturbed areas which are used for research and where you have the biodiversity thriving very well. This what is shown over here is how a biosphere reserve looks like. 
So you can see here that the innermost region of the biosphere reserve is the core zone. That core zone is the zone which lacks human activity. So it's exclusively for the animals and the plants for their preservation, for their conservation. The core zone is surrounded by a buffer zone, the one which has been shown in dark blue here. Buffer zone is the zone where there is a bit of ecotourism, a bit of grazing is allowed and research is also allowed. The last zone of a biosphere reserve, the area which is the outermost area of the biosphere reserve is the transition zone. It acts as a transition between the wildlife and the other settlements that are there in that region. That's why it's called as a transition zone. So it allows human settlements, it allows crop cultivation, it allows grazing and of course research and tourism. So this is the transition zone. We have the buffer zone and we have the core zone. This is how a biosphere reserve looks like. Now, uh, having a biosphere reserve is a very good thing because it not only helps us to preserve the habitat, it helps us to preserve the flora, the fauna and also the human communities which are attached to that particular region. So, it helps us to sustain their ways of life. Their livelihood is preserved by a biosphere reserve. In fact, biosphere reserves were included under the Biosphere Reserve Network Program by UNESCO. Uh, which in 1971, it was launched by UNESCO under the Man and Biosphere Reserve Program. And under that, India is having, as of 2022, India has 18 biosphere reserves. So these biosphere reserves are a very good in-situ strategy for protecting not only the flora and fauna, but also the ecosystem, the environment. Nilgiris was the first biosphere reserve in India. We have many, many others as well. The second type of conservation for uh, uh, or under in situ conservation strategy is having national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So as of uh, 2022, national parks are 106 in number in India and we have more than 565 wildlife sanctuaries. So we have a huge number of wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. The difference between these two terms is that national parks aim at protecting the ecosystem. So they are much larger, whereas wildlife sanctuaries are aimed for protection of the animals. So they are slightly smaller, but both of them are equally serving the purpose of conservation. One of the examples of national parks that we have around the state or in the state of Karnataka is the Banergata National Park, which is in Bangalore, or we have Bandipur National Park, Nagarhole, Kudremukh. And one of the wildlife sanctuaries that we have very close to the city of Bangalore is the Rangantitu Bird Sanctuary. So these are the second type of conservation strategy that is having national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. The last type of in-situ conservation strategy is having sacred groves and sacred lakes. Now, these are areas where, you know, they are like a protected refuge that are present. It's not only in India. We even have it in other countries like in Ethiopia. They provide shelter to many rare species of flora and fauna and they act as water sources for the local villages. So, these groves or these patches of forest are considered to be abodes of deities by the local communities, by the rural communities. And that is the reason these people protect that particular region in a very holy way. Because they are considering it holy, that region and its ecosystem is well protected. Some examples of this include the Khasi Hills of Meghalaya. We have the one shown here is the Ponar Kadia, in, uh, which is a sacred grove in Maharashtra. We have the Aravali Hills of Rajasthan. They're all considered sacred and due to which they're all conserved like that. They are not, you know, there is not much of human uh, habitation in such areas. Even in Ethiopia, we have a lot of forests where there are churches inside the grove. So that makes it holy and it is protected by the local people. These are the in situ strategies or on site strategies. When we look at ex situ strategies, it includes the strategies for protection of the biodiversity away from its habitat. So it includes the construction of botanical gardens or zoos or having aquaria where we can store, where we can have different types of species. We can have seed banks, have cryopreservation and field gene banks. So you can store the gametes of threatened species in fertile conditions so that much later in future when you have the right habitat you can grow them even home gardens can be considered as an xc2 strategy for conservation so these are the different strategies namely the in situ and xc2 strategies for conservation of biodiversity and we have also looked at the threats that are there to biodiversity the whole idea of conservation of biodiversity was given a lot of impetus during the Convention on Biodiversity, which I told you earlier, was conducted in 1992. And under that, there have been a lot of agreements, a lot of protocols that have been given to conserve biodiversity. I hope this video was useful to all of you. Hope to see you all in the next one as well. Thank you.